Science Department. He received his undergraduate degree in Earth Science and in Ancient History from the University of California at Santa Cruz and a PhD in Hydrology from the University of Arizona. He's the author of Rain in the Rio Grande, an Environmental History of New Mexico's Largest River. And um, he's our speaker tonight. He'll be speaking on Exodus and Archaeology. Dr. Phillips. <laughs> Yeah, it would probably be a good idea to at least, I don't know if you can do them partially, but if you do the front one, that would probably help. Yeah. They, they all go off together, but I think that right. we can see. You prefer it that way? Yeah, yes. Okay. So, <clears throat> um, it's become sort of traditional for me to give one of these lectures per year. And uh, this year, because mainly of uh, things that I've been interested in looking into, I have uh, decided to do it on the historicity of the Exodus. And so as uh, Wes uh, informed you in my introduction, I'm not really much of a historian at any rate. I'm a professor of hydrology, uh, but I do have an undergraduate degree in ancient history and I have written a couple of books on history, although not on ancient history. But this has been an interest of mine for a long time, so it's been something that I've tried to keep abreast of research on. So what's the fundamental issue or problem here? Well, the Bible presents the Exodus as the foundational event of the Israelite kingdom and nation, and not only that, it goes on then to become pretty pivotal in the history of both Islam and of Christianity. And so a huge amount of the um, source of uh, religious beliefs and um, perspectives in a, a large part of the world has basically goes back to the Exodus. However, if you look into modern scholarship, you will find that most modern scholars reject it as a genuine historical event. And I have to put a little side note in here, a sidebar. Uh, there is probably a wider diversity of opinions about um, history and archaeology related <clears throat> to biblical matters than there is to anything else. And so, for example, we had a speaker last fall, Stephen Collins, um, who is from Trinity Southwest Seminary in Albuquerque, who comes from a very conservative tradition of scholarship, which basically, um, you know, the, 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 their uh, beliefs uh, require them to come up with findings that the Bible is to one degree or another literally true. So there's a large body of scholarship out there that is sort of on that end of the spectrum. There's another body of scholarship that is on the end of the spectrum that we might call postmodern, which essentially <laughs> rejects everything in the Bible as having any possible historical relevance. <laughs> no, literally. <clears throat> and so when I say most scholars, I mean the scholars that are in the middle, right? Who are not approaching the position from an ideologically predetermined viewpoint. So, if this is such an important foundational event, um, as I say here, four-fifths of the Torah is spent talking about events that happen on the Exodus. That's how important it is in Judaism. Um, yet, most modern scholars reject it. What gives? What's going on? What are the facts here? What's the background? So, in my talk today, I'm going to, it'll be sort of in three different parts. The first part will be talking a little bit about the relevance of the events of the Exodus to um, uh, modern society and, and society in general. Um, a second part will be giving you some historical background on just the events of that period, particular period of time, and then I'll wind up with a historical assessment of it. So here, um, I'm, I'm going to, before we get into the sort of relevance to modern society, I presume most people have at least some idea of the events of the Exodus, but I'm going to go through it in really quick fashion. So I tried to find artwork to illustrate these things with you, and I will say this, this is one of my findings from doing this, that the amount of kitschy, really 
poorly done artwork related to the Exodus is enormous. It is unbelievable in magnitude. And I had to sort through a lot of junk to find something worth showing you up here. But, of all the things that I found, I believe that this one right here is my favorite. Moses and Jochebed. Who is Jochebed? The daughter of Pharaoh, that's right. So the daughter of Pharaoh goes down to the river to take a bath, and she finds this baby floating in the water in a reed basket and takes him home and adopts him, right? Right. And I have seen numerous other paintings of this event, but this one puts it in a whole different perspective, and I really like it. <laughs> okay, so Moses is raised in the court of Pharaoh, but he comes to sympathize with the Israelites, and one day he sees an Egyptian beating an Israelite slave, and he kills the Egyptian, and as a result he has to flee Pharaoh's court out into the Sinai Desert, and while he is out there, he encounters this burning bush that refuses to go out. He approaches it, and God, um, who reveals to him that his name is Yahweh, speaks to him from the burning bush, and he appoints, appoints him as spokesman to Pharaoh to insist that Yahweh wants his people to be set free. So, um, Pharaoh's heart is hardened, and he won't cooperate. And so in response, God unleashes the plagues. And so here's a really great depiction of the plague of hail and fire coming down. And so the plagues get worse and worse and worse until finally all of the firstborn of the Egyptians die. They were killed overnight. And when this happens, the uh, Egyptians say, we've had enough, get out of here. And they drive, it says literally, they drive the Israelites out. Okay, so here's some modern artwork for it. Uh, I assume that probably all of you have seen this in the much more dramatic um, uh, movie version of it. But here is Charlton Heston as Moses, and he has led the people of Israel through these giant towering waters of the Red Sea on either side. And here comes the Egyptian cavalry, the chariots, who are going to chase them down and annihilate them. But just as they do, the walls of water collapse in and drown them all. And that's, there's actually, if you read carefully the account in Exodus, there's two separate stories of how this happens. One of them is very naturalistic. It says a strong east wind blew all night, and it produced what we call in hydrology a siege. The, the waters of this shallow lake basically tilt, and so the Israelites were able to go across, and then the wind stops blowing, the waters flow back, and, and the Egyptians are stuck. Uh, but there's another version in Exodus which looks almost exactly like Cecil B. DeMille got the, the alternative version. Very good. So, they then go several days journey into the Sinai wilderness and they meet God in a very terrifying fashion at Mount Sinai. He gives them the Ten Commandments. But while Moses is on the mountain getting the commandments, the people get tired of waiting around for him and they make a golden calf and worship it. And so... Rembrandt here depicts Moses throwing down the tablets in rage and disgust at what the people have done. So, as punishment, they have to wander for 40 years in the wilderness until all of the people who participated in worshiping the golden calf have died. And so this is a nice old illustration of them with their ox carts and so on. And you can see this enormous string of people going off to the wilderness. And after 40 years, then, they work their way around. They don't go through Sinai and up into Israel from the south. They go around the kingdoms of Judah and Edom to the east. And they come in and uh, come into central Canaan. And then they slaughter everybody. And they take over the land. So, that's what it says. That's right. Um, so, uh, th these events, this story has had a deep, deep impact. And of course, you can trace it back through religious writings and history through the Middle Ages and all of that. But let's come up a little bit earlier. This is the Geneva Bible, the translation of the Geneva Bible, which was the Bible of John Calvin in Switzerland. And uh, on the title page of the Geneva, uh, you can't see it too well here, it's kind of fuzzy, but here, you basically see, here are the Israelites, they're camped in front of the Red Sea, 
and here's the Red Sea. This is the pillar of fire, right? That's God beckoning them across the Red Sea. And here you see the army of Pharaoh coming in to wipe them out. So why did John Calvin have the picture of the Israelites trapped at the Red Sea on the title page of his Bible? All right, because the Protestants were the Israelites trapped against the sea. This was the Catholics coming in to kill them, and God would deliver them from their peril. Okay, um, we're here in Socorro, New Mexico. We're uh, a long ways west in the North American continent, and the sort of um, westernization of where we live now happened during the last half of the 18th, 19th century. And um, so uh, it was all these people who just felt that they were just inspired to get up and leave their homes in the east and move west as part of a mass movement. It was a mass social movement. People justified it under the name Manifest Destiny. Here's a painting by that name dated 1872. And you can see all these people in different modes of transportation all streaming westward. And it's a very... Um, direct evocation of the exodus, right? They're going for the promised land. That's often what California was referred to, the promised land. <laughs> okay, the exodus has special meaning for African Americans. Um, <clears throat> spiritual song, go down Moses, way down in Egypt land, tell all pharaohs to let my people go. When Israel was in Egypt land, let my people go. Oppressed so hard they could not stand, let my people go. And of course those are the same words that Martin Luther King used in his famous speech against apartheid in 1965. That was the title of his speech, Let My People Go. Here is a very recent talk. This is a flyer for a seminar in 2013 um, at Florida International University titled let my people go, African Americans in the Hebrew Bible. Okay. And so in the bottom here I have a little blurb for a recently published book. It's actually, I believe, a 2013 book. Exodus and Liberation, Deliverance Politics from John Calvin to Martin Luther King. Published through Oxford University Press. And the author argues that over the centuries the Exodus story has been used for political reasons as an empowering story about overcoming slavery and oppression. And it very deliberate, very definitely affected and motivated this person right here, Oscar Romero, who was the uh, Archbishop of San Salvador. And he's lying dead on the floor in that photograph, having been shot through the head by a government assassin because, well, you can read, I won't even read it, it's about breakdown if I do, but you can read what he said up there. And that uh, goes straight back to Moses. And finally, the Exodus has been the subject of popular fascination for as long as we can remember. This is the most recent movie about based on the Exodus. Exodus, how many people here have seen that movie? No. Okay. Uh, I, I would definitely want to see it, but I haven't got around to it yet. Um, so uh, it stars Christian Bale and uh, as Moses, and he is a very martial Moses. Uh, he opposes uh, Pharaoh very forcefully, um, I understand from the reviews. Okay, so that's kind of a little cultural significance of the story of the Exodus. Let's dive into some of the history here. and. Um, to do that, um, I'll show you what my main sources are. Uh, there's a lot more things that I've read, but these are the ones that I consider to be most useful. A book, The Bible Unearthed, by Israel Finkelstein, who's basically the leading Israeli archaeologist, the most eminent and distinguished Israeli archaeologist. And Archaeology's New Vision of Ancient Israel and the Origins of its Sacred Texts. And so, it's a very well... Uh, thought out, well-grounded perspective. I don't necessarily agree with all of it. The middle one, Who Were the Early Israelites and Where Did They Come From? by William G. Deaver, who is an American archaeologist that has spent his whole life excavating in <coughs> Palestine. 
Um, biblical history in Israel's past. This is a particularly interesting one. This is not actually a historical analysis in itself. It is a summer. It's a it's a work of historiography uh, of evaluating historical treatments of Israel's past. And so the authors just go through and they say, okay, so-and-so said this, and so-and-so said this, and here's what the consensus of scholarship, if there is one, is. So it tries to be very, you know, it's not trying to prove a case. It doesn't have a thesis. It's just trying to inform you where the position of modern scholarship is. So I found that book extremely useful, although rather dense. Um, the one on the left there, Early Israelites, Two Peoples, One History, is one that provided some very interesting ideas. I'll show you at the end of the talk. It's, as a work of history, it's actually terrible. It is awful. But it does have some interesting ideas. There's another book by Deaver that contains a lot more information on the lives of ordinary people in Israel. And finally, here's a book from a more sort of conservative perspective. It's kind of a counterbalance to the Finkelstein book in the previous one, Ancient Israel's History. And it's a series of essays that are on different periods in Israel's history. Finally, I will mention that our speaker from last fall, Stephen Collins, has his own work on the timing of the Exodus, using historical synchronisms to identify the Pharaoh of the Exodus, published in the Biblical Research Bulletin. Um, and uh, I'll show you where he finds it here in just a minute. So, here is the setting for what we're talking about tonight, the ancient Near East. And I'll just identify some of the major places in here. Babylon and Nineveh, those were two. Nineveh was the capital of Assyria. Um, those were the, the capitals of two major empires. They don't actually affect our story too much in the time period we're talking about. So the ones that are most relevant are Egypt, and especially lower Egypt, as you see there on the map. And we see the city of Ramses, which figures prominently in the Exodus story in the book of Exodus and the Hittite Empire. That was the other major world power. And basically, what's called the Levant there, um, was, was, fought, was uh, fought over between those two empires. So here is a very schematic version of the route of the Exodus, starting out from the Delta of Egypt, <coughs> kind of wandering around in Sinai, going east of Edom and Moab, and in between Moab and Ammon, and going into the central highlands of Israel. That's what's described in the book of Exodus. And here is the area of Canaan, to which I'm going to refer to very frequently uh, tonight. So that was uh, a cultural area, basically. Um, the people in that area spoke a language called West Semitic. Uh, they all used the same script, at least at the beginning of the story. Um, they all spoke essentially the same language, and they all had very similar culture. So it's a rather homogeneous region. Okay, so what I'm going to do now is present you with a series of timelines. And these timelines are going to um, home in on the period of the Exodus. So this is a very broad one. The, by the way, all these dates are B.C., right? So zero is the line between B.C. and A.D. Um, so uh, time is progressing from left to right here. And this is the big one, 2,000 years, we'll eventually focus in right on this era right here. But I think it's good to put the issues in a bigger perspective. So um, up here we have Egypt on the top, and the heights of these various curves are essentially intended to represent how powerful those societies or empires were at that particular time. So we see we start out here at 2,000 in the middle kingdom of Egypt, there's something called the Hyksos that pops up in the middle, and then the New Kingdom. And so the New Kingdom is powerful. This is probably the time when the Exodus happened, and so the New Kingdom was powerful in that period of time. Uh, if the Exodus did happen, I should save you. Assyria down here, we won't worry too much about it. Babylon, they don't enter too much. Just for historical perspective then, the Persian Empire was actually a relatively brief period down here. Then we had Alexander the Great and the Hellenistic empires, and finally Rome. And of course Rome continued on a long time, off the right hand end of the graph. So the independent period of Judah and Israel as a nation is represented by that blue bar right there. Okay, the period probably corresponding to the Exodus, and this is sort of my um, interpretation on it, other people would disagree as you'll see in a moment. 
Um, but I would say it was most probably in that period if it did happen. Um, and one of the problems that we face is that this is the probable period when the books of Exodus and Deuteronomy and uh, Joshua and Judges and all those things were actually written down about between 600 and 700 BC. Okay? So we are looking at a time gap of about 500 to 700 years probably between the events and the historical records that we have. And this is a reason that many historians consider that the events that are written about in the Exodus are really probably only likely to be valid if you can find some external corroboration for them. So next we're going to focus in on the area in the blue box there. So we've expanded the timeline. Now we're only going from 5,000, sorry, from 1,400 to 500 um, BC. Okay, so I'll just um, point out some of the larger scale events down here. During this period here, this was the height of the new kingdom of Egypt. They had tight control of Canaan. Um, and their, their control progressively weakened over this period and somewhere right around here they pretty much lost control of it. Israel began to show up on the archaeological map about 1200 BC and then we can with some degree of confidence date the United Kingdom of David and Solomon over here around 1000 to 900 and then the kingdoms of Israel and Judah. Um, so a couple of prominent biblical figures and probably most of what we have in the Old Testament was sort of given its definitive form under King Josiah who lived about 625 BC. Um, but let's look at some of the events that are more particularly related to what we're talking about. The book of Kings, 1st Kings, says that the Exodus happened 480 years prior to Solomon beginning construction of his temple. So, construction of the temple was right about here, 975 or so. And so if we go 480 years back, that puts us at about 1440. Okay. Um, and so here is Stephen Collins' date for the Exodus, which is elaborated in a paper that's like 20 pages long. But his fundamental thesis is that that date has to be close to 480 years before the temple. He won't accept anything else. So he ends up a little bit off this, but not very much. Okay? There's a fundamental problem with that, and I'll show you in a, in a future one. But basically, we don't see any archaeological evidence of Israelites in Palestine until about 1200. So did that mean that the Exodus lasted for 350 years? Probably not. Um, <laughs> So most people see that date of 480 years as more of a symbolic date, right? It is 12 times, what is it, um, 10, no? 40. 40. 40. 40 times 12, that's right. And 40 and 12 were both very symbolically important numbers in Jewish numerology. So it probably has more to do with numerology than it does to do with dates. Um, then there's something called the Amarna letters here, and I'll go into more detail on that, but they give us information about what was happening in Canaan back in that period. We have the reign of Ramses II, who is the greatest king of the new kingdom of Egypt. Um, and we have the earliest mention of Israel anywhere in documentary evidence, that's 1207. And then something called the attack of the sea peoples, and those are all important events to our story. <coughs> so, there's the, again the same thing, likely time of the Exodus. And here is our next period of history that we're going to telescope in on. So now we're looking from 950 to about 1400. Um, we've cut off all that stuff on the right hand end. And this gives us um, ability to look at some of these things more closely. So, here's that back calculated date of 1440. Here is when the um, what are called proto-Israelite settlements begin to appear in the highland. Very, very unique and characteristic construction. 
that is really the, the hallmark of the Israelite settlements. And so we see the huge period of time in between here. Here is the reign of Ramses II. Um, okay, and here we could look at control, Egyptian, Egyptian control of Canaan. One interesting thing about the accounts of the Exodus is that it nowhere mentions the Egyptians in connection with the Israelites moving into Canaan. They're just completely not a factor. So that makes it, you know, had they tried to move in, when Ramses II was king, he had an enormous and very effective army. He was capable of combating the leading empires of his day. He would have had no problem wiping out invaders from the east. Um, so it seems likely that they could have only come in either toward the end of this period or here where Egyptian control weakened. So here is our next telescoping in in time. And a few more details are added here. Those are the reigns of the successors to Ramses II in the 19th dynasty. So his son, Merneptah, succeeded him in 1213. Um, and um, then in between Merneptah's death in 1203, and 1290, there were four pharaohs in succession. So basically, the dynasty was weakening, and uh, there was internal dynastic dispute, and finally, somebody else who may have been a distant relative of the Ramseids, uh, named Setnapte, came in and kicked them all out, and took over as pharaoh, and he started the 20th dynasty. Then his son, Ramses III, who was actually a very powerful pharaoh, ruled after him. After Ramses III, things started to go downhill again. <coughs> so, I'm going to go back to the big picture now and kind of step you through some of these things with a little bit more historical detail. <coughs> so where we're going to go right now is this Hyksos period that you see in between the Middle Kingdom and the New Kingdom of Egypt. Sorry, I should have got these animations out of here. Okay, who were, who the heck were the Hicksos? Okay, and, and yes, they were actually Hicks from the sticks. It's not an appropriate name. <laughs> um, so about 1750, the Middle Kingdom of Egypt began to weaken. And as it did, there were Semitic pastoralists um, who lived in the areas to the east, including Canaan and Sinai. And uh, they began to filter into Egypt because there was always abundant grass for grazing in the eastern part of the delta because they, the, the distributaries of the Nile River went out there and watered it. And so it didn't, you didn't have the problems of periodic drought that you did in Canaan. And so eventually they congregated together in a city named, named Avaris. And uh, Avaris eventually became one of the biggest cities in the ancient world. It was very important. By 1630, the Semitic um, kind of uh, desert people ruled the eastern delta and they subjugated the rest of Egypt, or at least lower Egypt. And they formed what was called the 15th dynasty and they held power until 1523. So Avaris, the site of Avaris, has been investigated in quite some detail. And so on the left you can see some of the actual ruins that are being excavated and on the right a reconstruction of the royal palace at Avaris. And this shows you um, where they were. The red and the pink color up there. The red color is the area that was directly controlled by the royal dynasty of the Hyksos. The pink area was one that was under their direct control, but not, um, not as personal sort of kingdom. And then the yellow is the area that they ruled, they dominated those people and ruled them as vassals. However, they never succeeded in conquering Lower Egypt, which are the green and the other color there. Um, and so the pharaohs that were based in Thebes, which is right here, uh, resisted them. And in fact, they hated them because they viewed them as impure outsiders. There was a lot of xenophobia, and they wanted to get rid of them. And so one guy who particularly tried to do this was a Theban pharaoh named Sekhene... <laughs> Sekhenere Tau, and his mummy has actually been found and identified, and 
Uh, you can see here and here and here and also down in his neck big gaping wounds that were left by Hyksos axes and daggers when he was killed in battle against the Hyksos. And there's a picture of a Hyksos a warrior, a ruler, in a chariot up on the top. That's an original tomb painting or something like that that's been repainted. Okay, um, so the Hyksos never succeeded in conquering Upper Egypt, and Amhos the first, who was the son of Sekin <coughs> Arei became Pharaoh in 1539 BC, and he resumed war against the Hyksos and besieged Avaris, and in 1623 he drove the Hyksos out. And uh, the, uh, it says he, it should, oh, the Hyksos pharaoh fled to their eastern capital, which was over here, here where it says Gaza, it was close to where Gaza is now. But um, almost followed him and besieged him there and wiped out the entire Hyksos dynasty. And then he was so concerned about these invaders from um, Palestine and Syria that he went on and he conquered that whole area and it remained under Egyptian control for the next 300 years. So let's go back to our timeline here. You can see um, uh, next on, on the left, in kind of right here, it says Amarna letters. Okay, so the Amarna letters are an archive that were um, of letters that were sent to Pharaoh Anket Aten, who's a famous monotheistic Pharaoh, a lot of you may have heard of him, um, and he set up a new capital city out in the desert, which was only inhabited for about 30 years, and so all of these inscriptions were just, these letters were just left behind when that city was abandoned, and so we still, they were excavated by archaeologists and translated. And they were written from vassal rulers in Canaan <coughs> between about 1530 and, sorry, 1350 and 1330. <coughs> and those rulers were very weak and they constantly appealed to Pharaoh for help. So we know a great deal about what the social situation was like. The rulers complained in particular about two groups. One they called Shasu, who were sort of equivalent to today's Bedouin. They were pastoralists, at least mainly, and they were sometimes warlike. <clears throat> but the main complaints were about a group called Hapiru, who were not an ethnic group, but was rather a designation, and it meant something sort of like refugee or stateless person. There were people who had been kicked out of wherever they had originally lived and were kind of wandering around, trying to find a place they could make a living, and the rulers of various places kept telling them, keep moving, keep moving. Okay? Um, they were hired as mercenaries. They engaged in banditry. And many of them may have been Semites who were driven out of Egypt after the fall of the Hyksos. But in the Amarna letters, there is no mention of a group called Israelites. And if there had been a group identified as Israelites at that time, they almost certainly would have cropped up because there's many, many of these letters and very detailed accounts. Okay, so next, after, now we have our blown up one here. So in sort of the left-hand side, we see the reign of Ramses II. <coughs> So Ramses II was the most powerful pharaoh of the entire New Kingdom, which had about a 500-year existence. Um, and so he combated the Hittite Empire. So here on this map we see the Hittite Empire in red, the Egyptian Empire in green. They had a great battle at the city of Kadesh in 1274, and they finally just decided to leave their boundary where it was. Um, there's a statue of Ramses at Luxor, um, and that statue it doesn't have much for scale, but it's like 50 feet high. Okay. Um, oh, one thing I mentioned here. Um, he constructed two huge cities called Pi Ramses and Pithom. So here's Pi Ramses and Pithom is close to it, in the eastern delta. And Exodus says that he conscripted the Israelites to work as forced laborers on building these cities. So that's one historical link. Um, he was succeeded by his son named Merneptah, and he ruled from 1213 to 1203, 10 years. There was a distinct decline in the power of the Egyptian Empire during that period. 
However, there was a coalition of nations and tribes who rose up in Canaan, and he defeated those. And uh, to commemorate it, which pharaohs always did, whenever they had a victory, they invariably set up a, a monument to re glorify it. Um, he set up this slab that you can see right here, which is called the Merneptah Stele. Stele is just a stone slab or pillar. And among the groups that he records as defeated, he says, the seed of the people of Israel is no more. In other words, they've been totally wiped out. And I always find this highly ironic that the first mention of Israel is this thing where this guy claims that they've been wiped off the face of the earth. Of course, he and his dynasty have been gone for 3,000 years, and uh, uh, the Jewish people are still around. Uh, so it's notable that in this thing, the, there's a glyph for these people, and it indicates not a nation with a king and so on, but rather it indicates a, um, a people, sort of an ethnic group, not a nation. Okay, so then we see that red one in the middle, four dynasty, four pharaohs in the end of the 19th dynasty. So decline and fall of the 19th dynasty. There were 14 years next, and the children and wives of Ramses II apparently engaged in this sort of endless internecine battles for the throne. Um, the throne ended up in the hands of one of Ramses' wives, uh, Queen I can never pronounce this. Tuset, Tusret. Okay. Um, the dynasty apparently became increasingly unpopular with the people of Egypt, and finally the nation descended into civil war. And so this distant relative named Setnakte took over and started the 20th dynasty. He didn't rule very long, but his son Ramses III succeeded him, and he was confronted by the invasion of the Sea People. So here in red, up on the top, you see the attack of the Sea Peoples, which was a little after the start of Ramses' rule, but not a whole lot. Who were the Sea Peoples? Yeah. Well, nobody really knows for sure. But they showed up in Asia Minor about 1190 or 1185, and it's very clear that they were from the general area of the Aegean. We know that because of their pottery, which is very distinctive. They attacked and completely overwhelmed. They obliterated the Hittite Empire. Wow. Then they turned south and decided to also obliterate the Egyptian Empire. So first they attacked the cities in coastal Canaan, and then they attacked Egypt in about 1175. However, Ramses II had an amazing success, and he defeated them both at sea and on land. And so they retreat. Oh, and this is the... Great thing about this period of history, there's so much documentation. So these guys with the feathered head gear, right? Those are the sea people. And then the other ones that have the hair that comes down are the Egyptian troops that are fighting them. Uh, and this is from a, doc, a monument of Ramses commemorating his great victory. They moved then back northward and they settled on the coastal plain of Canaan. And that area became known as Philistia because they were called Philistines, was one of their names. So the Philistines that are in the Bible, this is where they came from. Okay. Um, so, oh, I know. So back here, see the big blue one down here? Proto-Israelite settlements. What's going on there? Um, so the beginnings of Israelite settlement in the Central Highlands were sometime between about 1240 and 1220. And the, the wide kind of range there is partly because it was not a, you know, instantaneous event and partly just because of uncertainty in the dating because the pottery of these people was very difficult to date. Um, so this timing coincides very closely with the loss of Egyptian control. So here, Egyptian control weakens, right? And so this event happens at just about the same time and it was undoubtedly connected. Um, what is known about these early Israelite settlements? Um, first of all, they appear in areas that were up in the highlands that were previously very sparsely settled. Apparently at that time they were heavily forested. Um, and they cleared the land and, and made farms out of it. There's little sign of destruction of fortified cities, contrary to the accounts in Joshua, which had massive destruction going on. Pottery and implements appear to be very, very similar to those from the Canaanite populations that lived around that area at that time. 
Um, based on a little bit, there's not very much, but on a small amount of inscriptional evidence that's available, they spoke West Semitic just like everybody else in the area did. Um, their, their settlements are entirely agricultural and pastoral, and they're very uniform. You know, they don't vary much from place to place. So here's where they were. The blue outlines the area taken over by the Philistines at almost exactly the same time. And then the Israelite settlements first appear in this area right here. And then they spread up toward the north somewhat. And finally, at the latest part of this period, they moved down into that southern area there. So here is a house plan of a typical Israelite settlement. Each one of these boxes here represents a house of an individual family. And they calculate that it would probably have held between 4 and 12 people. Okay. So here is a reconstruction of what it looked like. Basically, um, they had sort of an, an entryway along the middle with um, roofs that came out on either side and had livestock in those areas. The people lived on the top floor. And so the warmth of the livestock rising up um, would keep them warmer in the wintertime. Everything is very utilitarian. There's very little beautification of anything. It's all The pottery is fairly crude. The implements are fairly crude. Uh, it's very egalitarian. All the houses are almost exactly the same size, and they contain the same possessions. Um, there's no sign of large administrative structures or temples. However, there is one big difference. I said in many respects their material culture was similar to the Canaanites around them. One big difference, no pig bones. Okay? Pigs were an extremely important part of the agricultural economy of that area prior to this time. So not having pigs was a big change. Okay. Um, they appear to have been organized around extended family groups, and they're sort of frontiersmen. They're, they're settling in uns previously unsettled territory, <coughs> not taking over land that had previously been owned. Um, they rejected most higher authority, perhaps because they started out as landless Hapiru, who were kept in poverty by the Egyptian government and local rulers. And so Hapiru may be related to what other word that we know better? Hebrew, that's right. So it's not, it can't be proven, but many scholars think that the word Hebrew developed out of Hapiru. Okay. Their, their new whole way of life here was probably closely connected with their ideology or religion, and the absence of pigs, which is a really glaring factor, is probably an indication that the worship of Yahweh, um, the God of the Old Testament, uh, was a factor, because we all know that eating pigs was forbidden, among many other things. Um, and that may have come from Sinai or Edom. So, let's start in now thinking about the events of the Exodus itself in this historical context. Um, can the accounts in the Torah be accepted uncritically as factual and literal? And the answer is, it's really hard to believe. And I just present this one fact here. Um, the enumeration in Exodus 12.37 claims that the Israelites could field an army of 600,000 men. Wow. Think about that. That's about the size of the entire population of Albuquerque. Okay. So if you count in women and children, that leaves you with about 2.5 to 3 million people. Okay. And then there were pastoralists, and Exodus continually refers to their livestock. Right. So if we only assume that we had three animals for every person, which in fact most pastoralists have a lot more than that, that would lead to 10 million livestock. So here's one of the kitschy paintings or drawings that I referred to, and I put it in because it gives you this idea. And then so even that, then you have to multiply the number of people in that drawing by 100 to arrive at 3 million people. Well, the Sinai Desert is one of the more arid places in the entire earth. It, we get eight inches of precipitation a year. We think we're a desert. Sinai gets two inches of precipitation a year. Okay? And that was true back then. Yes. Um, springs are very far between and they're limited in discharge. So Deaver, um, who has a lot of expertise in this, estimates that Sinai could not possibly have some more, supported more than about 5,000 people. Um, and that would have to be spread out a lot. 
And the entire population of Palestine at that time was between 50 and 100,000. So the idea that there were 3 million people migrating across the Sinai Desert it just is not within the realm of physical possibility. Okay. So let's move then from that sort of very um, broad brush analysis to a summary of modern scholarship. And here is what this book that I showed you at the beginning, Moore and Kelly, Biblical History and Israel Past. Here is their summary. No clear extra-biblical evidence exists for any aspect of the Exodus story. The majority of current scholars believe that the historicity of the Egyptian sojourn, Exodus, and wilderness wandering that the Bible remembers cannot be demonstrated by historical methods. At best, only certain aspects of the stories can be called plausible in second millennium Egypt. So I'm going to, these words that he's using, um, demonstrated, and plausible, you know, those are things that are sort of on a scale of historical veracity. So on the far right here, things that you have multiple lines of evidence that support that, we can call demonstrated or factual, right? Then um, if we can only say, well, there's no real positive evidence that something happened, but it's consistent with what we know about that time in history, we might call it plausible, right? Um, if we go off to the left and say, gee, that's not really very, we don't have any direct evidence, and furthermore, it really is not consistent with the way that things happened at that period of time, we could call it implausible. And finally, if you have direct evidence to the contrary, you could say it's disproven. And then right in the middle, we'll just call it no evidence, right? We can't have a basis for having saying anything either way. Where do we come in? Well, I would put that judgment that we just read somewhere about there, right? more toward the implausible side than the plausible side. So, specifically, what are the challenges to the historicity that um, uh, are cited in the work that I just quoted you and other works as well? And I'm sorry I put this in such small script. I'm sure it's hard to read in the back. Um, but first of all, written sources are not contemporary. They probably date from at least 700 years after the event. So you can't put a lot of trust in them. Um, there is no contemporary evidence in the forms of inscriptions, letters, or archaeological remains for the events of the Exodus. The traditional date of the Exodus just doesn't work. It's 250 years before Israelites appear in Palestine. Um, the Merneptah stele firmly places the people of Israel in the Canaan highlands in two, this is one place we have a really good date, 2007 BC. 1207. What? 1207. 1207, sorry. 1207. Um, so, 40 years before 1207 is about 1250. And that is the middle of the reign of Ramses II, who was the most powerful pharaoh for practically a thousand years in any direction. And he had firm control of all that region. So if a group of slaves had escaped, he had every capability on earth to pursue them wherever he wanted to and wipe them out. If they had somehow managed to escape and re-enter Palestine, he could have wiped them out on that end too. And he would probably have set up a monument to record his great victory. So it just does not fit together very well. Um, the material culture of the Israelite settlements was very similar to that of the surrounding Canaanite areas. No indications of new pottery or other foreign cultural importations. So the conclusion is that the proto-Israelites must have originated in Canaan and that the Exodus events are not only unsupported, they are historically improbable. Mm. Okay, so I want to just put it up here to make it a little bit more clear in the timeline. Here's 1207, the Merneptah Stele. There, we know that the Israelites are there then. So if we go back 40 years, that puts us somewhere back in here. We can go back 50 years, 60 years, 100 years. We still have all of the land of Canaan very firmly under Egyptian control. The whole story just does not hang together. So, are there any alternatives? Um, well, um, I did find one in this really, as I say, rather poor work of history by a Russian history professor named Igor Lepovsky. This book is actually a translation of his book in Russian. 
Um, and it dates to, it's fairly recent, it's like um, 2009 or something like that. Um, but in spite of the fact that his, his historical methodology is really abysmal, um, he has some good ideas. So, you know, the fact that somebody doesn't do very careful work doesn't necessarily mean that they don't have any good thoughts. And so he has two suggestions here that I found really intriguing. The first one is that the patriarchal, patriarchal accounts in Genesis are mostly really rather tribal history rather than personal narratives. Okay. And the second one is that Israel and Jacob were originally distinct <coughs> groups that actually experienced separate exodus events. So I'll step you through what he says here. Um, the first one about the names. Um, I don't know how many of you read this story. It's a wonderful story. It's one of my favorite stories from the Old Testament. Um, but uh, the basic idea is Jacob is moving back into Palestine from Syria. He takes his wives, and he's afraid his brother Esau is going to kill him. So he sends his wives and the servants away, and he sleeps all night at the ford of the, of the uh, Jabbok River. So it says, so Jacob was left alone, and a man wrestled with him till daybreak. When the man saw he could not overpower him, he touched the socket of Jacob's hip, so his hip was wrenched as he wrestled with the man. Then the man said, let me go, for it is daybreak. And the reason, of course, was this was a divine being, and if he saw him in the daylight, he would die. Jacob replied, I will not let you go unless you bless me. The man asked him, what is your name? Jacob, he answered. Then the man said, your name will no longer be Jacob, but Israel because you have struggled with God and with humans and have overcome. But, I mean, it's interesting to think about. He sends away his wives and everybody, and then the next day he appears, right? And they say, hi, Jacob, good to see you're still okay. And he says, no, I'm not Jacob, I'm Israel. Right? Overnight, literally, he changes his name. There's no other explanation. So, uh, Lepovsky's hypothesis is that this is, in fact, sort of a personalization of two tribes that were originally completely different, Israel and Jacob, that decided to unite together, and so they adopted, the, you know, fused their two names. So here is how he kind of hypothesizes things went. The semi-pastoral Semitic tribes move into the eastern Nile Delta during times of drought, and they're, this is during the period of the Hyksos, and they're welcomed by the Hyksos, their cousins to the Hyksos. However, following the defeat and expulsion of the Hyksos, the new dynasty forces out many of these Semites because they're considered to be undesirable and dangerous. These are the Israel tribes. So the Israel tribes try to return to Canaan, where they had started out from, but the land that they used to occupy has been taken over by other tribes, and so they have to become Hapiru and wander around sort of like gypsies looking for some place that they can settle down. However, some of the weaker tribes are allowed to stay in Egypt, but they are forced become forced laborers on these monumental constructions of the pharaohs. Um, so then we, you know, kind of move up to the time of Moses, and Leposky accepts the Moses story more or less as it's written. However, Moses is exiled to Sinai, where he is converted to Yahwehism. In fact, we know that the tribes that lived in that part of the desert. Uh, worship Yahweh, and probably the Israelites did not at this time. So this would have been an innovation. So he returns, he's convinced that Yahweh will free his people. And as the 19th dynasty weakens, Moses lobbies for the Israelites to be able to allow to go and worship their new god in the Sinai Desert. But they're refused, of course. However, during the Civil War, see this is part of the problem, people say there's no way that um, the Israelite tribes could have escaped under the iron rule of Ramses, and that's probably true. But there was this 14-year period, but with social chaos and civil war. So the government was not very strong at all. So they escape during this civil war and enter Sinai, about 1190. Um, so this is kind of the second exodus of the Jacob tribes. And Moses intends to lead the tribes to Canaan, um, seeing how the whole government was weakened, and he thought he could move in and take over there. But Ramses III defeats the Seed Peoples, and he regains control of Canaan. So he can't move back there. So the, uh, Moses kind of just leads them around in the wilderness 
until finally Ramses III dies and Egyptian control of Canaan weakens and now they can move in and unite. So over here, uh, uh, they combine with the Israel Hapiru tribes that are already in the Central Highlands and with their combined force they're able to start taking over the countryside. Okay, and so here you can put that on the timeline. So here is um, this period around 1190 when the, the rule of the pharaohs weakens. This is when Lepovsky speculates that they're able to escape. And then we see that very conveniently there's a 40-year period right here. Mm -hmm. And um, at the end of that period, the Egyptian control evaporates and they're able to take over. So it does chronologically seems plausible. And here's an interesting aside to kind of wrap it up. Uh, during the reign of Queen Tusret, uh, the real power was in the hands of a court official that was referred to as Chancellor Bey. And he was, a, he was from Syria, he was Semitic. So he might have somehow allied himself with these Semitic elements that were already in Egypt. After Senecate seized power, he made his own inscription commemorating these events on the island of Elephantine, and on it he records the following. He stretched out his arms to uproot and remove from Egypt those Asiatics who trespassed on it. They retreated to somewhere, and it's obliterated on the inscriptions, we don't know where it says. But he seized, presumably it was to the east, he seized gold, silver, and other valuables they had been paid by looting Egyptian temples and treasuries. And this brings to mind a passage from Exodus 20 that I always found puzzling. And so here it says, The Egyptians urged the people, that is the Israelites, to hurry and leave the country, for otherwise, they said, we will all die. So the people took their dough before the yeast was added and carried it on their shoulders in kneading troughs wrapped in cloth. The Israelites did as Moses instructed and asked the Egyptians for articles of silver and gold and clothing. The Lord had made the Egyptians favorably disposed toward the people, and they gave them what they asked for, so they plundered the Egyptians. And then immediately following that, it says they drove them out. So if they were favorably disposed, why did they drive them out? The whole story just doesn't hang together very well. Mm -hmm. But if you want to speculate a connection between the inscription of Setnakte and this passage, you can speculate that Chancellor Bey, the Asiatic himself, hired them to try and take his side in this civil war and paid them off by looting the Egyptian treasuries and temples, giving the gold and so on to these um, you know, poor people, basically, that he hoped to form kind of a paramilitary force out of. Then, when they were defeated and Setnakte came in, he wanted to you know, get back at them, and he was going to recapture them, and they escaped, as described in Exodus. So... It's very speculative, but um, it uh, might make a little more sense out of a connection between those two documents. So, to, to end it up here, here is where we left off with the uh, uh, evaluation, the consensus of the scholars as reported in the book that I cited previously, and after considering Lipovsky and the other independent things and so on, I've kind of revised that. And in my own mind, at any rate, kind of push okay. the likelihood of the exodus up about there. Okay. Yeah. And with that, thank you. <laughs>